attack targets. And he said, yes, you can say that. That is true. I think that uh, beyond the unsettling nature of the information, it, it gives viewers an idea of how, how difficult it is sometimes to, to, to focus the information in a way when you're dealing with sources and, and you did your job in trying to get it, as you always do. Uh, they wouldn't give you anything on what the targets might be, what the plan is. I gather they're not saying a thing. That's right. That's and right. Mike, uh, uh, do you see anything in the investigative side of this that says they are still uh, that federal officials uh, are responding in ways that suggest there may be a plot still out there. Well, I think the fact uh, a clue to that may have come from the press conference uh, with the uh, director in which he said they are assigning FBI agents to various airports around the country. Uh, there, there are certain military teams that are prepositioned uh, who could respond to uh, uh, more weapons of mass destruction, terrorism around, but I don't know any details or know, uh, I have no knowledge about the deployment of groups like that. And Aaron, I'd like to add one other thing. David was Please. talking about funding of uh, bin Laden and the attempts to cut that off. What we've seen in talking to terrorism experts who really know uh, this uh, Al-Qaeda organization is, is that a lot of these groups who operate under the Al-Qaeda umbrella, various terrorist groups in North Africa and others in uh, the Middle East, uh, have uh, with their cells instituted a policy of self-sustainment uh, in which uh, they are raising funds on their own on, on the ground, basically using uh, cybercrime. And a lot of, uh, I attended a conference uh, that had a lot of government and intelligence officials in Scotland this summer and it was called, the title of it was called Organized Crime and Terrorism and how they're moving into organized crime, especially identity theft, in order to sustain themselves for the long haul so they can operate for years at a time somewhere and come through with missions like this. Uh, Mike, David, uh, a lot of things have come up in just a, a, a very short time here. I know that you'll be back on the phones and working through some of this material. Thank you. And I apologize if I pushed you farther than you wanted to go or could go. Um, we all have jobs to do today. Thank you. Mike Betcher and David Ensor are working the investigative side of this. Uh, Judy is back uh, in the Bureau in Washington, I gather. Uh, Judy? Hi, Aaron. Yes, under warm shelter, I, I guess you could say, after having been at the cathedral this morning. Uh, you're talking with our colleagues uh, about fast moving developments in this story. Meantime, all across the nation today in houses of worship, in schools, businesses, and in living rooms. Americans have been praying and remembering the victims of Tuesday's terror. But at Ground Zero in New York, in the ruins of the World Trade Center, search and recovery efforts go on with yet another complication. Rain has slowed and at times stopped the operation. Right now, President Bush, as we've been hearing, is in New York. He's there to see the devastation for himself and to see how the city is coping. Earlier, the president did attend a prayer service at the National Cathedral here in Washington, along with many other dignitaries, including former Presidents Clinton, Carter, Ford, and Bush, the first President Bush. In other developments, three days after the attack on America, the president has approved the call-up of up to 50,000 reservists for recovery missions and to defend the nation. Congress has approved $40 billion in emergency aid to help victims and to hunt down terrorists, among other purposes. The Justice Department has released the names of 19 suspected hijackers in Tuesday's attacks, all of them believed to have links to Osama bin Laden. And the cockpit voice and data recorders from the plane that rammed into the Pentagon now are in the hands of authorities. They were recovered early today. Aaron. Judy, we shift uh, gears a little bit with the president now here in New York, spend some time on his visit to the scene, starting with uh, White House correspondent Kelly Wallace, who uh, begins our coverage. Kelly? 
Well, Aaron, exactly. The president at this very moment inspecting, getting a first-hand look at the damage. The president had said, aides said earlier in the week that he wanted to come here to New York, but he was concerned that he might get in the way, but that he was invited, of course, by New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, by New York Governor George Pataki, by members of the New York congressional delegation, and assured that he would not be in the way and that his visit would really be a morale booster for the city to show that the people of New York and the country stand united. Now, to give our viewers a little sense of this, the president, security is incredibly tight. The president traveling with a very small group of reporters, one of my fellow colleagues calling in what we call a pool report, giving us some of the sights and sounds of the president's trip here so far. And he talked about the intense security measures that are being taken. Of course, we know the White House told us just a few days ago that Air Force One, the White House had real and credible information that it believed Air Force One was a target of these hijackers. And so when reporters came to Andrews Air Force Base to get on Air Force One, they saw two fighter jets overhead as the president flew to the New York City area. The reporter noting that there was a fighter jet about a mile or two off the left-hand wing and likely to have another jet on the right-hand side as well. So security, very, very tight. We know the president wanted to look at the damage, Aaron. He also wants to meet with and talk with these rescue workers. You know he went over to the Pentagon a couple of days ago to do the same thing and when he was there Aaron he said he was really overwhelmed by the devastation at the Pentagon he said it made him sad but it also made him angry he said that the US would not be cowed by terrorists but he also sort of thanked the rescue workers and the Pentagon staffers for doing everything they possibly could to obviously see if there were any survivors there so we're likely to get the same message from the president today to these workers again the president uh, trying to get a first-hand look here likely to be an emotional moment for the president Aaron I would think so. You know, in our cynicism, sometimes uh, all of us uh, sometimes see these sorts of uh, moments, <clears throat> excuse me, Kelly, as uh, photo opportunities and really don't understand how important they are both, I think, to the president of the, of the moment and to the people on the ground to get a visit from the president of the United States, particularly when they're engaged in such difficult work. Exactly. I was speaking to uh, a staffer, to uh, Congressman Joseph Crowley. I had mentioned earlier <coughs> he's a Democrat representing Queens and some of the Bronx. And his cousin uh, happens to be a firefighter, a battalion chief for the New York City Fire Department, who has been missing since Tuesday. He is one of the members who urged the president to come here. And one of his top aides to the congressman said that this would really be a very symbolic visit, that it would be important for the president to come here to send a message to the people of New York City city, really to the people around the country, that the people of New York, the people of the country stand united, stand together, grieving together, and try to come together at this tragic time, and hopefully try to take steps so something like this never happens again. So peers, members of Congress, definitely very, very pleased the president coming here to send a message to the people of New York. Karen. And it is a message. The president landed in New Jersey. Air Force One did at an Air Force base. He's making his way by helicopter. Martin Savage has been down on the ground near uh, where the president will be joins us now. Martin. Well, Aaron, uh, one thing that can be said for certain is it's, it's not really known really, I guess I, I, I back up and start again. It's not known for certain if those people that are working as part of the rescue teams, as part of the volunteers, are thoroughly aware of the impending visit of the President of the United States. And even if right? they were, it is possible that they may not be concerned. And that is not to show any disrespect to the President. It is the fact that the job that they have at hand in their minds and in most people's minds is far more important the continuing search for survivors. You mentioned the weather aspect. One thing they have noted, the rain has stopped. Welcome news, because it had made conditions inside the work area extremely difficult for the firefighters and the would-be rescuers. That pile that they have been working on, the tunnels that they have been digging, and all of the work that they have been doing was made more treacherous by the fact that it was slippery, that it was wet, and that it was just extremely cold and bitter to work in. Now, with the fact that the rain has subsided and a little bit of drying is taking place, that's a good thing. The bad thing is the wind continues to blow here. Not so bad maybe where we're standing, but you get in the cross streets or you get in the upper buildings here. At times, those gusts can be strong. It's a concern because, as you know, there are a number of buildings that are considered to be unstable. They were concerned about them yesterday when there was hardly any wind. They're very concerned about them today when the wind is stronger. The wind loads that these uh, buildings can take now is in question, 
and engineers reportedly have seen cracks in those buildings begun to widen and those buildings loom over the heads of those that are trying to provide and care for any survivors if they can be found. In the meantime, this is a checkpoint. It's located about uh, three and a half blocks away from what used to be the World Trade Center. It is a beehive of activity, has been throughout the day. One thing we do note, though, people are coming out, but not necessarily people going in. An insinuation that the security has gotten that much tighter in advance of the president's arrival. Aaron? Uh, CNN's Richard Roth is also on the ground uh, covering the president's visit to the site. Richard, are you there? Yes, I am, Aaron. And uh, give me an idea of where you are, uh, Richard, and if you can see the president yet. Uh, no, I can't see the president. Uh, I am in uh, lower Manhattan, and we're still looking at uh, the devastation of the scene here, Aaron. But uh, it's still very quiet as uh, the mayor is, uh, in effect, cordoned off uh, most of lower Manhattan. You see a large group moving uh, towards the site. And when we get back to that shot, it's difficult for us to tell uh, precisely who's in the group, but they certainly are surrounded by a uh, bevy of security, uh, any number of people in uh, New York, uh, NYPD jackets, NYPD, New York Police Department would provide some of the security, of course, the Secret Service, much more there. As you can see, uh, uh, former First Lady Senator uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, New York Mayor Rudy Rudolph Giuliani in the scene, they're all wearing those masks that have become so familiar to everyone. Uh, we do not see the president in that uh, shot. Uh, off to the left of the screen, is this is a, a piece of tape earlier, uh, uh, New York's Governor George Pataki also in that group. Uh, go uh, Governor Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani has what? been given uh, broadly, I think, uh, pretty high marks for his handling of this uh, crisis over the uh, last Aaron. several days. Yes. Uh, I think uh, the pool reporter said that uh, the mayor and governor of New York had greeted uh, the president in uh, New Jersey at McGuire Air Force Base, so I don't think that uh, time-wise they would be with him, but certainly they are grateful for his arrival and the mood of New York, incredibly somber still, and the, the weather, as the, the other reporters have noted, is certainly uh, miserable during the night, uh, thunderstorms lashing Manhattan, and I think uh, the sound of the thunderclaps just uh, even more of a nightmare. Uh, in the early morning hours for New Yorkers, I think some comforted by the pelting rain on their own windows to uh, reassure them. But it's a split yeah. Manhattan, split Manhattan with upper Manhattan kind of getting back to business and lower Manhattan uh, totally shut down. Well, I can tell you the thunder and the lightning uh, around midnight last night got my attention. Uh, Richard Martin, hang on here. Kelly will keep track of the president. Elizabeth Cohen is at the armory where so many of the families of the missing are still gathered. Uh, Elizabeth, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Aaron. We're still here at the Armory, and there are far, far fewer people here than there were yesterday. Yesterday, there were lines for hours and hours. Today, there are far fewer people. However, today, this group of gentlemen came to look for their friend, Nick, Brenda, Marty. This is Mike and Mike and Dave and Jeremy. And Mike, could you tell me who was the last person who heard from, from Nick, and what did they say? Um, Nick actually contacted his mother and then called his father and said that they were evacuating the building right after the first crash, and we haven't heard anything since. So he was in the second building? He was on the 89th floor for Keith oh. Bretton Woods at the second building. Okay. And tell me, do you still have hope? We definitely still have hope. We came here. We're going to be out here all day. We were just at the armory. We registered, and we're going to go to all the hospitals right after this. And Nick, if you're out there, buddy, keep fighting. We're coming to get you. We're going to bring you home. You mentioned that his parents live in New Jersey, and about 40 or 50 of people are there trying to comfort them. What do you want to say to his parents? Mr. and Mrs. Nick and everyone else that's down there, Mrs. Brenda Marty, please keep hope. We're going to do everything we can to bring Nikki home. This is what I've been hearing again all day, Aaron, just like yesterday, just like the day before. People still have hope. They're still looking. Aaron? Uh, hope, as we said yesterday, uh, is, is what gets us through the worst of times. And for so many people, these are the worst of times, Elizabeth. Um, one other way that the families of the missing can uh, perhaps get some assistance, we've set up on our website at CNN.com a way for you to post 
pictures of uh, your friends, your loved ones. Um, let me run down some of the things that will make this work. When, when you send us a picture, and we'll tell you how to do that in a minute, you need also, please, to supply us with a contact number. We need, uh, people are going to need to be able to get a hold of you if they do, in fact, know something. Keep that in mind. It goes up on the website. Uh, the pictures will be posted along with those contact numbers, of course. Again, I want you to keep that in mind. In any case, email the photos to missing at cnn.com or you can log on to our website at cnn.com uh, click on the link um, I don't honestly know how many people are comfortable or, or know how to uh, email a picture if I had to do it I don't think I could perhaps along the way here today we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to be helpful there as well anyway the website's set up to provide that assistance and if you want to take advantage of it please do whether you're in the country or around the world as many of the missing were foreign nationals back to Judy in Washington. Aaron, the story moving forward on so many different fronts at one time. We're waiting now any moment for the Treasury Department to hold a briefing to talk about efforts to cut off the money trail to suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden. Uh, in the Congress, we've already been reporting about the $40 billion payment the Congress has voted to give the President, give the administration to provide relief, cleanup efforts. Kate Snow, our congressional correspondent, joins us now with some de developments, Kate, in terms of how some of that money is going to be spent. Kate? Right, Judy. The $40 billion, by the way, now passing the House unanimously, in addition to the Senate, where it passed earlier today. We're learning some news, Judy. We're learning that House Republicans and Democratic leaders have gotten together this afternoon. They've talked about the airline industry. It may surprise you to know that the airline industry is not doing well financially. They weren't doing well even before Tuesday's crisis, and now they're certainly not doing well. The House leaders have said that they are prepared and they are working on an emergency bailout measure to the tune of $2.5 billion. This would be money, Judy, that's included in the $40 billion that we've just mentioned, according to House Majority Whip Tom DeLay. This would be money taken out of that $40 billion, $2.5 billion, given in direct cash payments to the airlines. That, again, according to Tom DeLay, the House Majority Whip, the Republican Majority Whip, who just came out of that meeting. The idea is to try to keep the airlines afloat through all of this. Uh, as I said, they were already, uh, already, according to industry watchers, were in the hole by about $6 billion before, for the year before Tuesday's attacks. Now, in light of Tuesday's attacks, because the airports have all shut down, because of increased security, and because people may be afraid to fly, the fear is that they're about to lose another estimated $4 billion. So the total figure they may be looking at losing is $10 billion. And again, the Congress looking to help out, giving them at least a small piece of that in direct cash payments. Judy, back to you. Well, Kate, uh, that's an update on what they're doing on the fiscal front, if you will. What about on the... Uh, the military front, uh, diplomatic front. They're talking about a, a use of force resolution. The Senate has already passed that, Judy. Earlier this morning, the Senate unanimously, everyone in the Senate voted in favor of a resolution. It authorizes the use of U.S. armed forces for those responsible for Tuesday's attacks. And it very clearly says th that the use of force can be used also to prevent future acts of international terrorism by those groups responsible for Tuesday's attacks. The language is very important here, Judy, and they worked hard on the language. The Congress wanted to pass something to help the president, to give him some backing, but they wanted to be clear about what the president was authorized to do from their point of view. And again, he is now authorized by the Congress to use force against those responsible for Tuesday's attacks and against those, res those who were responsible for those attacks should they be planning any future act of terrorism. Uh, they do not give a carte blanche, if you will, to the White House. They do not say the president can, can do whatever he wants. And that was something that was a fine point that had to be negotiated. Judy, as you know, there's always a little negotiation on Capitol Hill. Uh, but that's the way the language stands now. Th that has been passed by the Senate. We do expect it'll come up, expect it'll come up later today in the House. Judy. 
All right, Kate Snow bringing us the latest from Capitol Hill, what the Congress has been up to. We've been, as we said, we're watching for the Treasury Department to brief. We're looking at the trails of the investigation of this story. And of course, in New York, where President Bush is touring uh, right now, the, the uh, ruins of the World Trade Center. But for now, we're going to go to our colleague Bobby Batista in Atlanta uh, for Talk Back Live, which of course normally is seen at this hour on CNN. Bobby. Judy, thank you. This is actually the first time that Americans have been able to sit together and react to the events that happened on Tuesday. And we virtually have a, a mini United Nations, if you will, down here. We have folks from Germany, Ireland, Mexico, South Africa, uh, and of course, Americans who would like to react to everything that happened on Tuesday. So let me go straight to the audience and get some. Tony, you're from New Jersey. Yeah, I'm from Trenton, New Jersey. And uh, I just want to start off by saying, you know, I'm outraged uh, about what I've seen so far and what you know what's been done at the World Trade Centers and also um, you know Washington DC and also in Pennsylvania which doesn't get mentioned that much lately in the media um, my main reaction and my gut feeling from an emotional side is that the US once they have all the facts that they're that they should be swift and unrelentless in their in in getting to the bottom of this and, and taking care of this whole situation we also happen to have with us in the audience uh, former UN Ambassador Andy Young, who's with a group here from South Africa. That was a nice coincidence. Ambassador, welcome. Your thoughts on what's happened this week? Well, it's horrible. And uh, it's something that we've got to find a way to put an end to. But I, I think having gone through this here in Atlanta five years ago and still not having caught the terrorist who bombed Centennial Olympic Park right across the street. I think we have stopped terrorism in this country even though we didn't catch the terrorists. And I think that that's one of the things that I wish we would focus on. What are the causes of terrorism in the world? I think we looked at America, we looked at uh, McVeigh, and we began to see, we began to define that sickness for the world, and particularly for Americans. And we made that kind of behavior unacceptable for Americans. And I hope we can do that on a global basis. Terrorism really did exactly the opposite of what they hope to do. They hope to demoralize America. We are more proud to be Americans than ever before. We looked at our values. We believe in our democracy. The free enterprise system has worked for us. We're strong in our religious faith, our commitment to education and the values of this society. And I think that we've got a battle of ideas, not just trying to get even with somebody. Thank you. And over here to uh, Tracy. Hi, I just want to say that uh, terrorism is something that many other parts of the world have been dealing with on a very regular basis and that we should consider that when we start expressing anger and uh, although it's an awful situation, I think that we really do need to look at the intelligence element and maybe look at what we can be doing to get more information and possibly go back to some things that we were involved in in the past, which is paying for information and having informants and really get at the network as opposed to the individuals and absolutely uh, what Mr. Young says is it's a really a global issue and we need to deal with it in exactly that fashion. We have a number of guests who are scattered uh, amongst our bureaus here to take uh, questions from any of the folks in the audience but before we do that uh, I'd like you to meet uh, two people no, we don't. We, all right, we don't have them yet. As, uh, we will go to them in just a few moments. They, their husbands were victims uh, of the uh, attack on the World Trade Center, and uh, they will tell us the story of what has happened to them and what they hope has happened to them in just a few moments. Um, a couple of emails that I'm getting. Kid in Virginia says, in honor of our country and all the brave firefighters and police who have been such wonderful heroes, I have decided to send my tax refund to the American Red Cross. Julie in South Dakota says, an early morning phone call from my young Marine son overseas. He told me we are ready to do what it takes. We will not let our nation down. God bless our United States of America. Uh, up to the audience. And Jack. Jack. Uh, as an American, I'm enraged. And at the same time, I know we need to temper things with a little good judgment and patience. And we do need to use the intelligence that I believe Tanya mentioned earlier. 
But I think at this point now it's a little late. America's been stomped on, and I think if we know within a shadow of a doubt who has done this, we do need to act swift, we, swiftly, and we do need to move in with a military strike as soon as possible. Afghanistan is suspected as harboring these people. If they've been asked to release him or uh, divulge where he's at, I think we need to resolve to go ahead and do something because it shows weakness and not strength if we wait much longer. All right, Jack, thank you. Our guests in New York are ready now at this time. Uh, Amy Everling is with us along with uh, Kristen Kane. Both of these women have husbands who were in the World Trade Center at the time of the attacks. We thank you both very much, uh, Amy and Kristen, for joining us. Have you heard anything at all uh, about the welfare of your husbands at this point? Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Yeah. We, we know that they are most likely still alive. The uh, two colleagues that they work with made it out of the elevator before it the building collapsed. Um, so, well, tell us where. Tell us what floor they worked on in the World Trade Center, and what happened to them that they ended up in this elevator shaft. They worked on the 89th floor of two World Trade Center, which was the first building that collapsed. Um, they they made it out in the elevator. I talked to my husband briefly before they were on their way out. Um, the reason we know they're in the elevator is because uh, Linda Rothman made it out, um, and she got the. Uh, firemen to come to the elevator and uh, and try to get the other guys out. Um, there are about 15 more people in this elevator and um, even though they went through a free fall there was a safety mechanism at the bottom that prevented them from crashing into the ground floor. Um, however, you know, they're still in there because they couldn't get out. The firemen could not cut them out before the building collapsed. So I know they're down there. We know it's the Elevator bank on the left-hand side, if you enter in from Liberty Street, we know it's the second elevator from the left-hand side, um, so we know which one it is. We know that they were in good health, and uh, it's just a matter of getting them out. If we could get the people there to start digging, I mean, there's 15 families here that um, have family members in there that, that they'd probably like to know they're still alive, too. Why not? Are you in New York? I do not. She's on the other one. The guy, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure they can hear us anymore in New York. Amy, Kristen, yeah, can you hear I'll me? Hear you. Okay. Hear you okay, yeah. we lost you there for a few minutes. Um, okay, so uh, let me try to understand this. Your husbands and a bunch of other people got in this elevator, it went through this free fall, and the brake went into effect, which you know kept them from falling right. all the way. And they ended up between like the ground floor and the first floor. Correct. Yes, that's and where the, they are. And so, okay, um, so firefighters are now, now telling you there is a good chance that they could still be alive because there's enough air in there. Yes. We're hoping. Yes. Mm -hmm. How much air? We've been told ten days worth of air. Um, possibly yes. Possibly yes. But um, I talked to Lauren Smith, which is also one of the young ladies who got out of the elevator. Is their colleague. And uh, she said that there is a crack in the door, um, small enough for them to fit through, but air is coming in. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the so water. What kind of help uh, are you guys getting from uh, rescue workers in New York to try to get to them? I have had an angel on the ground. His name is, uh, uh, he's an officer, um, uh, Louis Savelli, and he's been giving me updates every now and then when he can. Uh, the last word I heard last night is that they finally secured the building enough to get inside. Um, they're able to enter um, from both sides of the building now. And um, some firefighters, I, I, I don't know if this is true, but um, they're hearing tapping. And they know that there are people down there. It's just a matter of getting enough people or workers in there to get them out. So can they give you a rough est estimate of when they think no, they might be able no, to get in there? Oh, I know that's so frustrating. And that's the frustrating part. And it's not just us. We're here for the other family members of those people that are in the elevator with them. You know, um, there's 15 people that are still alive here. And if they're looking to find some people still alive, this is where they can go. And that's what we're trying to let everyone know. Tell us, uh, if you will, about your husband. They, they work for uh, the brokerage firm Keith Broyette and Woods. It was on the 89th floor. They're in the research department. They're, the colleagues that they got out were also in the research department, the two women. The one woman is perfectly fine. She's home in Baltimore right now, so she can verify facts in this situation. Uh, they left before the building collapsed, but you know they were encased in the elevator, so we're hoping that that was the safest place to be at the time. 
The other young lady, Lauren Smith, is in the hospital at, at uh, Lexing Lenox Hill. Lenox Hill. She was just transferred there um, today, uh, yesterday, so they can verify the information with her as well. Um, All they, right. they're, they're good men, you know, and I'm sure everyone out there, you know, their loved ones are just as wonderful. We just want them home. Well, our thoughts and our prayers are with you both, and the best of luck. Amy and Kristen, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so for much joining for joining us. Time. We're thank hoping you. for you. Um, let's go to Elizabeth Cohen here uh, for a few moments. She's at the Armory in New York, where we're hearing a lot more stories like Amy and Kristen's. Elizabeth, are you there? That's right. Hi, Bobby. I'm right here. And I'm here at the corner of 26th and, and Lexington where people have been standing in line to go inside to register information about their loved ones. The lines were around the block yesterday. People waited right. for an hour. Elizabeth, hang on just one moment. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt uh, Elizabeth, uh, but uh, Marine One is uh, landing uh, in New York now with the president on board. Aaron Brown is in New York. Aaron? Helicopter landing, and uh, the president will make his way to the location, as we have been telling you. I believe that's the president's helicopter. The first helicopter must have been in the advance team or security team. In any case, the president will make his way towards the World Trade Center site under um, very, very tight security. As you can imagine, uh, on any presidential trip, security is very tight, uh, especially so, especially so here. Um, the pool report uh, uh, by pool reporter David Gregory talked about uh, fighter jets flying on the wings of Air Force One, just off the wing of Air Force One as they came up from Washington uh, up the corridor. Um, Martin Savage down on the ground along with a number of other CNN correspondents. Uh, Marty, uh, are you able to hear me? Not yet. Uh, Richard Roth, are you able to hear me yet? We'll work on that. Certainly not a sight that people in New York are accustomed to. There we to. go. Perhaps it is a sight that the people in America will be growing accustomed to in light of the changes in society and in life in general ever since the devastation that took place at the World Trade Center. Activity here as far as supplies and equipment going in has been brought to a standstill. That seems to be a clear indication right now that the whole security cordon has been carefully put in place now in light of the president's visit that is expected to be very soon. But it has not disrupted the work that is going on at the site. They realize this is vital. Certainly the White House would not want to impede in any way the chance that survivors could still be found. And despite the rain, despite the change in the weather, despite the wind that blows, the threat that hangs over their head from buildings, the morale is still high. The hope still burns very strongly in the minds of many of these rescuers. It should also be noted that despite the heavy downpours of rain, the fire continues to burn deep inside the World Trade Center. The smoke may not be so obvious against the background that is no longer blue, but it is still there. Those fires are about 65 feet underground, Aaron. Marty, let me interrupt you for a second. We've seen just in the last few minutes here a number of uh, helicopters uh, flying in the area, and it, it's not clear to us and maybe producers on the ground have a better idea here which one the president is in, though that may be exactly the idea. Uh, uh, we see a fighter jet there. Uh, this gives you a sense of just how tight the security is. Uh, that fighter jet circling that helicopter looked to us uh, very low altitude to the rather dense clouds in New York today. It has been, for those of you just joining us, rainy, quite cool uh, and miserable down on the site and across the city. Kelly Wallace, up on the roof, I believe, uh, has a view of this as she looks downtown. Kelly? Aaron, exactly. Just as you're noting, the evidence of uh, fighter jets and helicopters in the air, another example of the absolute very extreme security precautions that the Secret Service, the administration taking as President Bush makes this visit to, to New York today. We know the president very much wanted to come here and he will try and get a first-hand look at the damage left behind by Tuesday's attacks. We also expect him definitely to talk with the firefighters, the hundreds and thousands of firefighters and other rescue workers who are working around the clock, obviously going through the rubble, trying, trying desperately to see if there are any possible survivors in there. And again, you know, we can't underscore this enough. This administration very concerned, of course, remaining on a high state of alert, obviously, as our colleagues have been reporting today, evidence that there is still a definite threat out there. 
Uh, and so, of course, this White House taking every extreme precautionary measure to make sure the president, his aides, very safe as he tries to come here. A very symbolic move for the president. This, uh, Aaron, the president taking on the very difficult role of trying to comfort a grieving nation, coming here to talk to the people of New York City, but also to send a message to the country to try to help them at this very difficult time. Balance, balancing that, though, Aaron, with, of course, his resolve to not only try to find those responsible for these attacks and hold them accountable, but this president saying that this will be the focus of his administration, trying to stamp out, I think he said whip out the other yesterday, terrorism around the world, and that that is going to now be the focus of this administration, just nine months old. Aaron? There is a, uh, a, a heliport right along the Hudson River, <coughs> excuse me, on the west side of Manhattan, and uh, it looked to me at least uh, that's where the dignitaries and uh, officials who are going to greet the president on his arrival have assembled as the helicopter goes behind that building. When we looked at the shot of those people waiting, we did not see the president, nor did we see any of the activity that would suggest the president's helicopter has landed. Uh, perhaps this is the one, as we said, a number of helicopters preceded uh, this one on the ground. It may have been just other officials, <coughs> excuse me, or it may have been decoys a way to uh, uh, just further, I guess, the security that is already in place. Um, Kelly, uh, because you're one of the White House correspondent team here, uh, do you know how long the president plans to spend on the ground here in New York? Well, it's interesting, Aaron. The White House really not trying to give too many details, trying to uh, keep uh, very private and under wraps exactly what the president will do, be doing here, in part because of, again, the extreme security measures that are being undertaken. So we know the president will be on the ground and will, again, look at the damage. We'll talk with some rescue workers. Uh, we expect this to be a relatively brief visit. We do know that because, again, the president not wanting to get in the way and interfere with any rescue rescue operations, wanting to come here, give somewhat of a morale boost to these workers and firefighters and to the people of New York City and send a message to them, but also then get on his way and let that work continue when he leaves. Uh, we see helicopters continuing to circle uh, in the area. That one I am uh, positive as I eyeball it is not the president's. Uh, that, that looked to me to be much too small. Um, in any case, we wait for the president to put down at a heliport on the west side of Manhattan. Richard Roth is uh, not far from there. Richard, uh, what can you tell us? Richard? Security is tight and uh, security is going to be uh, using decoys and whatever it takes. Uh, it's a, a wartime atmosphere here. Uh, the sun actually coming out for the first time uh, in a day uh, from the west. Uh, but uh, the uh, weather conditions obviously uh, hampering uh, the search and of course you have overhead that uh, roar of those jets that we've been hearing for three days. But for the morale, uh, I think uh, the, the workers are going to be grateful for the president's visit, but uh, the frustration I think will quickly set back in. Uh, no one being recovered in the last few days and uh, it's going to be a limited visit. It and the sheer weight of the numbers, I mean, 4,700 people unaccounted for. And if you talk to anyone in New York, instead of how was your day and how are you, now it's uh, who did you lose, how many did you know, and you hear someone say, I lost uh, my brother, uh, a friend of mine lost three cousins, I had eight friends in the building, uh, and this is going to reverberate through this big city uh, for months and years. Somewhere in this group of uh, helicopters that's <coughs> circling the west side of Manhattan, the lower uh, west side of Manhattan looking for uh, waiting for the president to land is the president and his helicopter we haven't seen him yet <coughs> excuse me uh, yet another helicopter putting down and we'll see if the president is on board this one suspect he is to be honest uh, Kelly uh, you go on these trips all the time uh, just as you've been watching this does it just look different? Is there more? Are there more things in play? More planes, more helicopters, more signs? Definitely, Aaron. I mean, there, well, as you know, of course, uh, there's always tremendous security surrounding the president any time he takes a trip in the United States or certainly around the world. So definitely security always tight. We are seeing 
beefed up security measures, things we haven't and don't normally see. But again, that is just another example of the situation that the White House and the administration now facing. We see, and again, we don't know for sure, but we do believe that is likely to be the president's helicopter. And the president, I believe, Aaron, was getting an aerial tour of uh, to see the damage from overhead. And again, that was likely to be uh, pretty difficult for the president to see the damage and destruction when you look at it from above is uh, pretty enormous. The president would then get down on the ground and uh, view things firsthand from there and then talk to some workers. So uh, as you know, Aaron, you saw the president in the Oval Office yesterday sort of balancing two emotions. Uh, you know this president to be a very emotional man. And when he was asked how he's sort of handling this, if he's praying, he said he didn't want to talk about himself. His focus was on the, the family families and children. And after he said that, he sort of bit his lip and clearly was starting to tear up. At the same time, during that Oval Office appearance with reporters, he also was very determined and showing his resolve, saying that this is sort of an act of war on the U.S., the first war of the 21st century, and that he was committed to doing everything possible to find those responsible for those attacks, those organizations or countries which support or harbor terrorism and to work with the international community to wipe up to wipe out terrorism Aaron, the president saying it's a time of great tragedy but that he was going to try to use this as an opportunity while he is in the white house to do everything possible to try to reduce the terrorism threat around the world Aaron, before the president uh, made his way to new york he signed the formal declaration of a national emergency uh, that is a legal requirement that allows now the Pentagon to call up as many as 50,000 reservists, though. Uh, the Pentagon briefing earlier today suggested the number will probably be somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000, many of them in the Air Force, others uh, in the Army, the Air Force uh, flyers and support uh, uh, domestic patrols as we understand it. Uh, many of the soldiers and their support, the Army, will uh, be in support of people on the ground here. We see the White House Press Secretary, Ari Fleischer, coming off um, and wait for the President to come off. Uh, as those of you who just may be getting home from work today, it has been a miserable day, uh, by and large, in New York City, cold, wet, rainy. Uh, that's what the President's walking into, Martin Savage. Well, Aaron, one of the things that I wanted to bring out to you is the fact that a comment that has been made by so many of the workers that have been here that have traveled from so far, seeing it on television is one thing. Seeing it in person is vastly, vastly different. They remark that television, even with the many different angles, with the many different cameras that peer down consistently, just do not do justice to the amount of damage that has been done and to the extent of the the tragedy that can be seen spreading out around the World Trade Center. So one of the clear things, obviously, as President of the United States, but also as an American, is the impression he is going to get from being here on the ground, from seeing it firsthand. Aaron. Marty, we, we remember being with uh, President Carter 20 years ago after the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens. Uh, when he flew over the site. Judy Woodruff, in fact, was on that helicopter with us back then. And uh, that's exactly what he said, that uh, television doesn't begin to do justice to the magnitude of something as, as big as the event is, the screen remains the size it is, and it all has to fit in the screen. And when you see it in person, you do get this extraordinary sense of how large the area is. The other day, Gary Tuckman, who got quite close to Ground Zero, correspondent Gary Tuckman, uh, talked about uh, blocks and blocks, ten, 10 blocks, I think, around the, uh, the Trade Center that uh, showed uh, dramatic signs of destruction, buildings collapsed, uh, heavily damaged. And so the president flying overhead uh, in the last few minutes, no doubt, got an impressive and we suspect somewhat depressing look at the magnitude of what those two planes did when they came crashing into the towers of the World Trade Center at 8.48 in the morning on September 11th and then again at 9.08 in the morning. How long ago that seems. Yes, it does. Marty? Yes, sir. Um, are, are you seeing any sense of 
of busyness. We, we just, there is the president uh, dressed in a, looks like a khaki jacket just uh, behind uh, the fellow in the Red Coast Guard uniform. Uh, Governor Pataki with him. They're moving behind that, uh, it's like a fire truck to me, Newport Air, uh, Newark Airport fire truck. This, the heliport, it would be a relatively easy location to secure, relatively easy, because it, it, on one side is the river. If that's in fact where they are, and I believe it is. Yeah, I, I believe it is. They're clearly along the water, and it does, it, it, it gives you one less area uh, uh, that is difficult to control. Obviously, it's not a perfect area, nothing is, but that would be a little bit easier. Uh, we saw a number of uh, congressmen uh, from the New York area uh, who were part of whatever delegation, formal or otherwise, is there to meet the president. Uh, the New York governor, George Pataki, who has been in the city uh, rather than the state capitol since this all began. And we certainly uh, expect we'll see uh, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani as well uh, making the walk. Uh, the FEMA director has been in town, a longtime friend of the president's, Joe Alba. And um, I, I believe in the pool report, uh, David Gregory said that a number of the people on the president's plane were wearing FEMA jackets. Um, uh, Judy uh, can join us now. Judy? Aaron, um, as we're watching these pictures of the president in New York, uh, we can tell our viewers that uh, White House correspondent John King uh, has learned that the president has declared a state of national emergency today a legal requirement, we are told, tied to the decision to authorize the Pentagon to call up National Guard and military reservists uh, in the wake of what happened on Tuesday. Uh, John uh, King reporting the declaration cites the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and notes, quote, the continuing and immediate threat of further attacks on the United States, end quote. Now, of course, that's a reference to what uh, investigative authorities are telling our reporters that uh, that it is not wrong to assume that there still are people in the United States uh, with plans to do uh, to do further great harm to this country. The president also issued an executive order. We're told uh, John King learning uh, authorizing the Pentagon to issue that call up to guard members and reservists and he has sent a letter to Congress notifying them of all of these decisions. Again, this reporting coming from uh, our White House correspondent, John King, Aaron. I, I, I believe I, I saw this correctly. The president did not get into the usual limousine. He got in uh, to one of those uh, uh, SUV, large SUVs, uh, that generally hold the Secret, Secret Service agents in the motorcade. I'm almost certain that's what I saw. Uh, it would. And one more small sign, but a sign nevertheless uh, that the security is quite tight. It looked also to us that a number of agents were in, in, that, uh, in that SUV. The president making his way from the west side, from uh, the Hudson River uh, across now, uh, and it's not very far, to the site, and there's a look at the site. It is still smoldering all these many hours later. Uh, and even despite the rain that has uh, created a, a somewhat dangerous situation, slippery, muddy, it has certainly been a dreadfully uncomfortable day uh, to do this awful and uncomfortable work. Uh, Martin Savage has been down there all day, and he, you know, it's, it's, he knows better than any of us here, certainly, how uncomfortable it has been for the, for the recovery teams. Well, that's right, Aaron. It has been very difficult for the recovery teams. It's been difficult for the people who've been doing the digging. A lot of the digging work had been done almost by hand, literally bucket load by bucket load that is passed in a human chain. That is done because they say that there is so much uh, smaller pieces of debris, dirt and papers and, and pieces of the building that are really too small to be handled because what has happened is that they are trapped inside of steel girders, they're trapped inside of large chunks of concrete. So they cannot approach with the heavy equipment until this debris is pulled out of the way. The fact that it was raining so heavily made that work very difficult at times it had to stop. Uh, the fact that it's dried out now means that the work can begin again. And we have been told that all of that material is sifted through, that the buckets are actually 
turned upside down and carefully gone through, looking for evidence, looking for remains. And then, of course, there was the threat of the wind. It has subsided somewhat, but still those buildings that are still standing but damaged are very much a threat to the rescue crews. I was standing out here this morning, Aaron, um, staring. I find myself looking at it. You are fixated on that spot when you are here, even though the towers are gone. And a police officer uh, sort of caught me deep in thought and said, it isn't going to change. It looks the same. And he's right, it is going to change. And I found that it was something inside of me, and maybe in a lot of people. That's what's changed. Well, uh, it, it may not change, but our impressions, how we feel about it, tends to change as we stare at these things. There was, uh, we saw a painful, I think maybe is the right word, account of uh, the other day that the search teams as they go in are carrying uh, essentially small dishes or plates so that as they find remains they can be taken to morgues and held and, and ultimately DNA tests can be done. This is how in many cases people are going to be identified so families can when that becomes necessary have funerals for their loved ones say goodbye and in ways more appropriate than this. Um, thousands of DNA tests are going to be done. There's still almost 5,000, 4,700 people that we know of uh, who are reported missing. And it is, uh, we also, uh, there have been a number of accounts of people who have made cell phone calls out uh, that it, it, and, and helping um, rescue workers uh, to locate them and, and get them out in the hours, in the f first hours. There hasn't been much of that, and no survivors have been found today. Um, there's also an effort made to get cell phone calls in, that is to say, to call the cell phone numbers of people who were working in the building. The cell phone technology essentially would, would allow then the phone company to track where that cell phone is, it also, if the phone is still working, the ringing sound itself might uh, help rescue workers identify uh, where uh, someone uh, is buried, possibly still alive, possibly not, but would help them locate someone. There was a report I heard earlier today that rescue workers, some of the firemen thought they heard some pinging sound, someone maybe banging against something, and I haven't heard anything on that since. Uh, so what we know for certain is that so far today, no more survivors have come from uh, come from the site at all, Marty. You're right. When we talked to the rescuers that were coming out this morning, those that had worked the night shift, they said that they had not heard the typical sounds that had been heard days before. Uh, yesterday, they were telling us of the cellular telephone calls that you were talking about. Um, and they told us specifically what they knew about the individual. I'm not going to pass that along because it would only serve to give hope that may not really exist at this point mm -hmm. to a family that waits. And then there were the tapping sounds, the knocking sounds that have been reported. And you know, it's, it's a remarkable scene when you're down there at this search site and there's literally hundreds, sometimes thousands of people at work at the same time. And there is a shout that goes out, quiet. And it's passed throughout the throng of the rescuers. And very quickly, that whole site becomes so silent you could hear a pin drop quite literally. The engines are shut down. Everyone stands in place, almost holding their breath and listening along with that person who thought they heard something and above all hoping. Time goes by and then it all begins again. Aaron. Richard Roth is uh, down on the streets as well as Richard has been, uh, as, as Martin Savage has been down there for the last several days. Uh, Richard? Yes, uh, Aaron, I, I kind of struck by something maybe with a political touch that doesn't really seem that pertinent now, but uh, for, and it seems almost meaningless, but if, uh, for months there was so much talk in New York City, when would the new President uh, Bush visit this city? There had been uh, more of a Democratic turnout here. It was now Senator Hillary Clinton. It all seems so uh, ridiculous now. Uh, who would have thought uh, months back ago that uh, this is how the President Bush would return to the city? He'd already been here once before, maybe mm -hmm. a second time, but uh, brief visits. But uh, it's incomprehensible that anyone could think about that's how George Bush would come to a city, which is uh, needed of a morale boost. Uh, and they're going to get one today by the visit by the President. Judy? 
Aaron, uh, again, as we keep an eye on uh, the president, uh, what the president is seeing there in New York City, um, we are constantly watching the developments in the investigative front. And I can tell you that our national security producer, Chris Plant, is reporting that the Defense Department's investigating the possibility, as hard as this is to believe, that two of the alleged terrorists involved in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Now, this is according to a senior defense official. The official uh, th this official didn't reveal the names in question, so we don't know whom he's talking about or other specifics, such as what kinds of schools they may have attended. But the official said two of the names released on Friday by the Justice Department matching the names of people who had attended schools or courses sponsored by the U.S. military under a foreign military exchange program. Now, I should say that officials at the Pentagon are cautioning it's possible that these matching names are merely a coincidence or that the terrorists were using false identities. And of course, we've been pointing that out on CNN all day long, that they may have taken on the identities of other people. Uh, Pentagon officials also wanting us to know that uh, military officers from many countries around the world attend these U.S. military academies or courses every year. So this is done all the time, but what irony it would be if it turned out that one of these terrorists uh, had been to school at a U.S. military-sponsored course. You're watching now in New York, streets of lower Manhattan, a motorcade with the President of the United States. See, some people uh, on the sidewalks there uh, don't know if those are civilians or, or firefighters, rescue workers, as the motorcade makes its way through the city. Aaron, can you tell us, uh, do we assume traffic has been completely, maybe, well, you've, already it, answered, maybe you've already answered this question. Yeah, um, well, as you know, because uh, of, of your years uh, at the White House, whenever the president moves, uh, essentially traffic around the president shuts down. If you're on a freeway, uh, they shut down all the exits along the way. Uh, and in fact, the other day I heard uh, former Vice President Gore make a, a remark about that uh, as he talked about his new civilian life. There isn't much traffic down on uh, lower Manhattan. There, the, the, these days it's all pretty much cordoned off anyway. Um, and clearly nothing is moving very nearly around the president at all. Uh, the president is, uh, we believe, in one of the suburbans, uh, um, large SUVs that always accompany these motorcades, usually filled with Secret Service agents, sometimes uh, medical personnel, all part of the formal movement process of a president of the United States. And these things are kind of large and unwieldy, as you can imagine. Um, and particularly down in that part of Manhattan, where the streets get a bit narrow and tight, uh, so they'll move through here. And it has stopped, and we, we can't tell you why it has stopped. We just don't know. Much longer motorcade than the typical one the president would be traveling in. It seemed that way to me. Uh, it seemed that way to me, that there were uh, considerably more cars in the motorcade than you would normally see. And we assume that there are a fair number of uh, New York City, New York State officials, FEMA officials, and the like. But uh, as you can see, that's, that, that's the back end of it, and it's still going. Those, the white cars would be, I'm um, almost certain, would be New York City police cars, would be part of the motorcade. We see a number of ambulances uh, as well. Uh, so you, you would have New York City police, you would have Secret Service. Um, Kelly, you, you most recently, I guess, uh, uh, of us been in these motorcades. Who else is in that long line, would you suspect? Well, it's hard for me to see from the vantage point looking at the monitor here, but uh, as you and Judy both noting, uh, obviously a tremendously long motorcade. You have senior staffers and those traveling with the president. You have a whole slew of Secret Service officers there. You have, you know, New York City Police Department and uh, ambulances on hand and uh, more security measures than any of us really know. And as you know, Aaron, uh, the U.S. Secret Service not talking about, and, and we certainly understand and they never do, talking about the security measures that the Secret Service takes to make sure that the president is safe and sound. All we know is that the U.S. is really operating on a heightened state of alert, and that is expected to continue 
for an indefinite amount of time while there is still a concern about threats out there. So uh, we just can't underscore the security situation as we also noted yesterday. We saw it firsthand around the White House. We saw that the Secret Service decided to expand the security perimeter around the White House, basically closing off to uh, pedestrian traffic several blocks around the White House and also to any vehicular traffic as well. So uh, they are taking every, every step they can take to make sure that the president and his top aides are safe and sound. Part of what's so difficult right now for the administration, for the country in many ways, is that while the president wants to project a sense that things are okay, uh, in fact things are uh, uh, something less than okay, uh, this uh, gathering at the National Cathedral uh, today that Judy was at, uh, most notably absent from that was the vice president. Uh, who uh, we gather was kept away for security reasons. They didn't want the president and the vice president in the same location.